This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Coin Gaming, Cosmos Ecosystem, and Paraswap. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. Oh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful day. What is up, everyone? I am Charlie Shrem, and you're watching and listening Untold Stories, where five days a week for me, but only twice for you, we get to dive deep, and hopefully more. I get to, well, maybe one day we'll start to releasing more episodes a week. We get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders and spend a lot of time investigating who the people that not only have their finger on the pulse right now, but who are the people making the decisions who really fundamentally understand better than I what is going on because I always want to be the person that understands everything. So this show is my journey to understanding everything and, and now we get to have it where everyone gets to listen in and watch in. And to really understand where we're going, we need to understand where we came from and hopefully tell some fun stories along the way. Today, I'm very excited to be joined and I'm happy we're able to get the show together, Jason, by an alpha, a good friend of mine, Jason Blick. Jason, you're the chairman of Ekify. You're the CEO of Ekib Bank. Uh, you're also a qualified UK attorney, which I think they call a solicitor, right? Is that the, and I actually don't really know the differences, but we'll talk about that later. And you went on to manage legal and compliance in over 90 countries for over for Sun Microsystems. Super cool back in the day, overseeing uh, $1.5 billion a year in transactions. And then you became the CEO of Financial Partners Bank that had over 12,000 clients and like a billion dollars in AOM. And you've been involved a lot in a lot of like financial services related businesses and things like that. But it seems like from doing my research of your life, you've always like kind of like been on the cutting edge. So it's like a wave. You're like on the top of that, you're like a surfer that never finishes surfing. You know, you're just kind of like riding that. So I started following your career about a year or two ago when we started talking. And it's been nice to see uh, uh, things coming to market and you've been able to do what you do and not only service the crypto folk, the crypto industry, uh, and like a lot of the Bitcoin OGs, but also be able to launch two technology, uh, all these amazing technologies. Jason, thank you for coming on Untold Stories today. Charlie, it's my pleasure. My only concern is I think you just aged me with that biography. Well, I can read like I can I can write a biography for someone and they could be 15 years old and make it sound like they're like 50. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be on and uh, looking forward to talking a little bit about DeFi, a little bit about what we're doing, where we think the market's going, where the opportunities are. Uh, over to you. So let's I want to actually understand a little bit about like the history of of financial institutions uh, in America and in Western Europe and largely like the rest of the world following. I want to understand something a little bit here because I've kind of like throw these metrics out on the show all the time. Realistically, traditionally, like crypto, forget pre-Bitcoin, pre-Bitcoin, and then taking the financial crisis of 2008 and then 2001 out of the picture, assuming that we've had decades of normal financial institution those years. If I'm keeping a million dollars at the bank or $100,000 at the bank or even $1,000 at the bank, financial institution. What traditionally are normal run-of-the-mill banks doing with all of that money sitting there? And like, what, how much money are financial institutions really making off of us? Assuming we do like we're like the average customer, average balance with we do a few transactions a month, write checks, blah, blah, blah. Like what is what are banks doing with that money traditionally before the crypto world? That's a great question. Today, um, there are about 134 trillion dollars sat in banking assets around the world. Wait, um, say that again. And so it's a, it's a big number. Uh, and what do they do with that money? What do they do with those deposits? Well, they 134 trillion. It. You said right? That's crazy. 134 trillion dollars. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the largest industries in the world. And if you combine it with investments and derivatives, you're talking about 1.2 quad. It's incredible numbers. So what are banks doing with this money? Well, traditionally, they lend it. That's how they make money. Of course, they make a little bit of money on FX and transfers, SWIFT, et cetera. But the real meat and potatoes is in lending. So I put $10 into the bank, and the bank might lend eight of that across its existing network. And all of that's fantastic until there's a run on a bank, as we saw in 2008. And then we hit problems. So the centralization of banking and the changing nature of regulation and capital adequacy ratios over the years has um, resulted in a series of losses and a series of failures. So 
it remains an interesting, uh, necessary part of our lives. But you've really got to dig deep in terms of what the banks are doing with your money. And of course, whether there's been any previously missold products, are there any AML issues, um, KYC problems that may well, well haunt the bank as a whole, uh, and the kind of risk profile that they embrace. Hmm. So you have all this money coming in, and then we're trusting these financial institutions. And the only reason that we don't have to have more oversight is because there, there is federal oversight, right? And state oversight with, with banks and financial institutions and whatever countries we're talking about. There's some, so we, we kind of like trust it. And then over the years, we've had it time and time again, these banks make bad decisions and between fractional reserve and things happen. They, I mean, we've heard the story so many times over, over and over and over again. And the reason that we've not been able to do anything is because there was never like, physical digital representation of money. There was never that actual like token or coin that represented the actual value that you were depositing at this financial institution. And so now we're seeing a wave of like, you have like super non-crypto financial institutions, then you have super crypto financial institutions and get regulated and have certain fiduciaries and custodials. And then like Ekibank uh, launched before DeFi what were some services that you guys offered and what did you like start doing before Equify? Like Equify, what did what were you doing that was on the, the cutting edge or at least how you were helping uh, crypto folk, uh, crypto companies, treasury management, like manage their businesses and things like that. Uh, now that you had like the ability to actually like receive money in different ways than wire transfers, like there's actual physical representation of that money now. Yeah, so we, we started Ekibank in 2015 with one specific objective, to become the world's first global digital bank. And one of the problems we see with banking today is most of them are, are around because of a series of mergers. If you look at HSBC, for example, over the last 20 years, they've amalgamated and grown as a result of acquisitions, not only in the US, but Europe and what have you. And the truth is it very rarely works. All of these guys and girls are fo focused on their individual markets, UK, US, Hong Kong, or whatever mm. else it may be. And their profit centers are focused on individual geographies. So you often end up with a conflict between uh, the various geographies of banks and also the nature of the fractured operating model. If you add on top of that se severely uh, old technology, uh, obsolete in many respects, legacy tech, then you've got a problem. You've got a recipe for disaster. So we did a few things differently in 2015. Uh, we launched one set of products available uniformly to 180 countries. So you kind of get rid of that complex um, fractured operating model. Um, so today we have clients in nearly 100 countries and they avail themselves of bank accounts, credit cards, loans, OTC, um, uh, custody services and wealth management. Now, we do focus and we do meet the needs of the crypto and the fintech community. So you are starting to see some good of the banks out there, like Sovereign and Silvergate, the guys sure. who know. But at the moment, it's a very big problem for many of the, especially new crypto organizations and fintechs, to actually open an account. And the minute you start to see too much transaction flow uh, with those deposit facilities or current account facilities, it's not uncommon for your account to be closed. So we focused on the needs of that industry, and we slowly built up. Uh, what I believe to be a really, really good client base. And you raised a fantastic point, risk. Now, we mentioned that the biggest area of risk for any bank is capital adequacy ratio. Uh, they simply lend more money than they should, and people get nervous because of the market or whatever else. They run to their bank to take all their cash out, and there isn't enough money. For us, we made a decision very early on to, to not lend on our balance sheet. So there is zero debt on our balance sheet. So if every client came this afternoon to withdraw their money, it's perfectly okay. Not a problem whatsoever. But then you have the incredible advantages of what DeFi represents. So rather than build a balance sheet of debt on our book, why don't we work with customers so they can benefit from, from lending and borrowing amongst themselves, but still have some level of um, sure. respectability by DeFi being powered by a digital bank? So what you're saying is, if previously the financial institution had to do all the work of sourcing the yield and then taking all the risk on the yield, and that's why banks would, would make traditionally, I don't know, 18% on your dollar, 
or whatever it was per year, and they only giving you a half a percent, what you're saying is because the yield, because some of the risk now can be passed on to the, to the token holder. So if I deposit a million dollars worth of a token, I can find yield, stake, and earn, you know, earn percentages on chain sitting at a bank now. Because I can do that, a lot more of the yield can actually be passed on to me. Of course, you guys deserve some of that because you're managing that. But because it, more yield, as opposed to my bank here, more yield can be passed on to me because now, because of the technology, risk can be shared. Capital allocation can be shared. Uh, appetite can be shared. Exposure can be shared. And it can be spread. And it creates a much more like efficient market, does it not? It absolutely does. I mean, today, it's a very one-way street. Uh, clients are just clients of a bank. Uh, a bank delivers a service, and that's pretty much it. We prefer a model where clients become partners of the bank. Uh, so we do provide banking as a service, for example, which is enabling uh, fintechs to white-label our products and go to market with their clients in their brand and offer financial services. So we believe it's the role of banks to innovate enormously and get away from the siloed structure of, I'm going to take your money and I'm going to charge you fees, into how can we help you make money uh, with very little or moderate risk? So Ecubank decided in 2000, and, well, late 2019, but we really started in 2020, to launch a small subsidiary, which is majority owned by us, Ecufy. And Ecufy provides a series of DeFi products which really, as you say, empower the community, give them the opportunity to leverage the advantages of a traditional bank, but really control their assets themselves. And um, we're really excited about it. Hey guys, the Coin Gaming IO folks are back at it with another amazing promo this time. They're giving away three Teslas from April 19th to June 27th. It's so cool. Bitcasino.io forward slash Charlie. There's so many incentives and promos and things that they've been giving away over the past few months to my listeners. But now if you go to Bitcasino.io forward slash Charlie and you play their game Live Crash and you can get in the top 10 in all 10 tournaments, you will be entered in to win one of three Teslas. So all you got to do is go in there, play some slots, play some games, get into the top 10 in any of the games, and you'll be entered to win one of three Teslas. I mean, how cool is that? They've been giving away stuff at St. Patty's Day, at Valentine's Day. They're constantly, we're, we're always doing so many amazing promos. Bitcasino.io forward slash Charlie. You will not be disappointed. We have all these coins and tokens and they sit on all these different blockchains and we have to keep multiple wallets and different addresses and everything. And the only way to do it without having to do that is trust a centralized place like an exchange or a broker or an app that you use. Well, what if there was a way to do it without having to trust one different place in the ethos of crypto? Cosmos, my sponsor Cosmos that has been around for so long they're actually following their original roadmap and being able to offer universal wallet, high node synchronization, inter-blockchain communication, bridging Bitcoin and Ethereum together and keeping it all on one wallet, being able to build on top of it and do the coolest things possible. Make sure you check them out at stargate.cosmos.network. You can play with all these different features. It's so cool, and it's really bringing the next wave of crypto and adoption. If you really want to be ahead of everyone else and all your friends, make sure you understand the new technology that's coming out. Stargate.cosmos.network. You're going to love it. I've been talking about our sponsor, Paraswap.io, for a while, and I really love them because not only are they our sponsor, but I use them. If you go to Uniswap or any decentralized exchange or even centralized exchange, there's a gas fee for every transaction you do. It just takes time and a lot of money ends up costing hundreds of dollars. With Paraswap.io, you can actually identify and define all the transactions before you do them, and then it processes them batch in one transaction on the blockchain. Not only that, they just launched their new optimization called Hopper that optimizes gas fees by 30%. And, and beats all the market prices that you're used to. It's so cool. Paraswap.io. I love talking about them. You'll love using it. You're going to be like, Charlie, where have you been all my life?
you know, you're 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 not just uprooting banking, and I don't mean just you. I mean, kind of like this. You're you're a market leader in this sub industry in this subsection of our overall crypto industry. But there are competitors of you, and there are others, which is always a good thing. It's always good to not just be the only one. But you're definitely a market leader. And I'm gonna say this: it's like you're not uprooting banking as so much to say as like you're taking Bitcoin, you're taking banking back to its original roots. And if that's not the title of the show, then I'm firing my writers. But but, but hear me out for a second. Let's go back to those old Westerns and the old TV shows and movies of like medieval England, right? Why were banks created? Why were financial institutions created? And it's the same reason why there were financial institutions in prison where I was. There were financial institutions and their money and they competed with each other. And the reason it's the same answer is because you had people who were coming with money that they were custodializing on their own. You know, in the old Westerns and stuff, people would keep gold. They would bury silver and gold under their houses. This was before banks were like a norm. A norm. Uh, you'd get paid in some sort of like physical currency or physical value or earn it. And then you'd convert that to these bank certificates. And there were so many banks around the world. And these bank certificates became the de facto money because that's what people were used to using. So at the original roots of banks were not, hey, you're forced to keep your money somewhere. So therefore, it's, it's a race to who's going to give you the shittiest services. But rather, banks were created to service people who needed or wanted these services. And that's what you're doing because now people have come to you with crypto. That, so they're coming to you with physical manifestations of their money. And they're saying, hey, how can... What value proposition are you giving me if I deposit my crypto with you? Or rather, like with my other bank, I have no choice. If you're kicked out of a bank, you can't go anywhere. You can't have a physical representation of your money. Yeah, you can get a cashier's check, but what are you going to do with that? You can't cut it up into five pieces and pay people with it. You are forced to go into another American financial system. You have to stay in the box. So because you stay in the box... And because the FDIC controls that box and the FDIC, if it was up to them, they'd only want three banks in the whole country. That's why they forced all these banks to amalgamate with each other back in 2009 and 2010. Now, because you created another alternative system, you are saying, hey, we can operate, we can provide amazing services and we can give you better yields. And, and when people say like, oh, how is crypto going to totally revolutionize the banking system? This is how. That's absolutely right. The truth is that what we're doing with Equify, I mean, we have four products with Equify, fixed rate product, fixed uh, a variable rate product. Uh, we have a yield aggregator and we've got an interest rate swap product. Now, the truth is that really sophisticated banks are going to move into DeFi over the next two to three years. They have to evolve. They haven't yeah. changed in 500 years. How though? For absolutely 500 years. Can you imagine any other industry that hasn't changed in 500 years? And the, and the truth is that people are getting a bit nervous. Like, so let's use the US. 20% of the entire supply of the US dollar was printed last year. Yeah, it's crazy. How can you have that much faith in an industry, a factory, that will just print out dollars all day and night? How can you not at some point get to a hyperinflation situation? And as you rightly say, at the moment, in most instances, the centralization of banks means that you're entirely captivated by them. You're entirely reliant on them. So this small little industry of DeFi, which today is tiny, it's 105 billion as of today, I mean, minute in relation to other financial services, is going to ta start to take a major, major role in diversified financial products over the next three years. And if other banks are smart, They'll take the risk off their balance sheet and they will give the opportunity to clients to be able to service their needs amongst themselves, obviously take a small margin on, on however you construct it, but you're taking risk from the bank. You are giving clients the bigger opportunity to secure yield and you're providing an additional level of comfort because you haven't got much of that risk on your existing balance sheet. That's how you create trust. What else is going to happen? What else is going to happen? Well, you know, banking itself is a big industry. We just referenced it: 134 trillion. It pales Holy in crap. significance when you're talking about derivatives and interest rate swaps. 
So the interest rate swap market is over $500 trillion. <laughs> Do you not think that's an area that uh, the crypto community and the DeFi community should be tackling? I know we are. We're launching our um, uh, interest rate swap products in about two months' time. But what a market to tackle. $500 trillion. The market cap of all crypto, including Bitcoin, is like just at like $2 trillion. Like People don't realize crypto just surpassed the market cap of Microsoft. Okay, so like just Microsoft. People are saying like, why is the market cap significant? Well, one of the reasons a significant measure is because that's all of the money that would otherwise be somewhere else earning yield is now in crypto. So people believe that $2 trillion worth of people believe that they're better off keeping their money in this than they are in the legacy systems. That tells me that we're doing something right. Because what and other industry is, is grassroots like that? Nothing. Oh, it's nothing. It's 1.3% of banking assets. So there's no question that we're going to see major drive. I mean, just look at the DeFi market, 105 uh, billion. It sounds like a reasonable number. We've had 5,000% growth in market cap over the last year. We've had 19,000% growth in IPY in just one year. So what are we going to be in five years? It's going to change everything as long as innovative banks get involved and support it. Now, obviously, the, the Equify is different from EquiBank. There's an arm's length relationship. But the fact that we power that um, uh, DeFi community, the power that DeFi organization is a very unique way to present existing public markets yeah. with an opportunity to embrace DeFi in a way that they're familiar. So it's like you're giving... It, it, you're you're giving the folks that are used to the normal like interface of of finance, but at the same time starting to create those services uh, and different products that that we want. But like you're not doing it where it's like too pushing too far. It's like you really have to ride that. What we're talking about the wave analogy. Like if you push, okay. So like if you're a boat, no one really knows this. But I'm going to teach everyone boating right here. If you're ever drive, captaining a boat and you're riding a wave, whether it's you're, you're going from the Gulf or the ocean and you're going to an inner sea, a lake, an inner sea, uh, going through a jetty or an inlet where the body of water is different and you notice waves and you notice like current and you're going over that where your props are out of the water, right? So like Jason, you're riding that wave. If you put your gas a little bit too much, if you put your gas forward, too much if you try to if you try to like go ahead of that wave the boat will actually go nose first into the wave into the water and capsize and you'll you'll all die so like you have to perfectly like ride that wave of the market if you're going to be like trailblazing here because if you go too far forward i was talking to someone this morning so many businesses have failed because they came to the mark to this industry a year early mm -hmm. uh it's it's so, but you actually you said something cool. What's a yield aggregator? A yield aggregator is an automated tool that reviews every other decent yield product out there and combines it. In the traditional world, we would call it a fund of funds. And the truth is, there's some great yield products out there. A dear friend of mine, Tim Frost, who you interviewed fairly shortly, has got a great product called Yield. Yeah, Tim's awesome. So some of our guys, our traditional guys, you're talking about you know traditional family office. Uh, fund money and what have you, doesn't have time to start examining the complexity of current yield farming opportunities. They wouldn't even know where to start. But by using something that they're familiar with, an almost fund of fund structures, a yield aggregator, they get it and they like it. And that's one of the unique opportunities. If there are any other really smart banks out there, start to look at this product set. You can mitigate risk enormously uh, by having a diversified portfolio of DeFi loans, um, DeFi investment products and yield aggregators. And the smart guys are going to get it soon, hopefully. Can we actually break down yield for a second? Um, right now, like how do, you, how, do you, how do you create risk buckets? How do you create risk tiers for the current yields that can be uh, chased in, in crypto right now? So for example, if you look at keeping money at regulated institutions uh, like like yourselves or like 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 I know BlockFi and Voyager, or, and Voyager offers nine percent on USDC. 
So mm. you're talking about the lowest risk appetite there, publicly traded company, financial institution. I'm an investor there as well. And your USDC is issued by a bunch of banks. So 9%. And even 9% is like, most people think that's a scam. But like, there are better yields with just a similar risk. Like what's, what's going on out there? Yeah, it's a great question. The truth is that underlying all of this is people's comfort in the, the leading cryptos. So they genuinely do not want to part with their BTC or their ETH. Maybe you're mining it, but you still need access to working capital. So these guys and girls don't mind paying 9, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16 percent for money market loans because it's insignificant in relation to what they believe their underlying assets are going to be. So as a result of that, you've got some very, very cool yield products out there. Now, some of them are maybe taking a little bit too much risk. And, mm. and I think, you know, when you're talking about some of the, uh, some of the extraordinary returns that some products are talking about right now, you should take a long-term view of those opportunities. That said, there's no doubt that there's growing maturity in the market. So today, what can I do? If I have my US dollars, I can park it in a bank. I'm, I'll be lucky if I get 1.2%. If I hold euros, I'm going to be having a negative interest rate. I mean, just yeah. think about that for a second, Charlie. I put 100 euros into a bank in, in the UK or France or wherever else. And at the end of the first month, I've got 98 euros left. So you know, how is that possible? How is that reasonable? Crazy, right? If you convert that into a reasonable DSTT product, you could be getting 7, 8, 9%. And as long as you're careful about the yield and the farming opportunity you select, you're pretty, you're in a very good chance of maintaining that rate for months or years to come. So you can imagine the opportunity for banks. For example, we're looking at the opportunity of providing fixed term deposits for three, four, five percent. It's a way for traditional depositors to, to lodge US dollars and then for sophisticated banks to use that capital in a DeFi loan that is really secure. I mean, let's be honest. If you've got the collateral, you've got BTC, your loan to value is 70%, you can automate it with oracles the result of any collapse in the market. You've got plenty of opportunity uh, to ensure that you're not going to face a loss on that loan in a way that you could never achieve with an SME corporate loan or a mortgage or whatever else. Well, so want- in, oddly enough, it, de- it actually de-risks a financial institution. It does. It de-risks a financial institution because you have now the ability to collateralize a liquid asset. But most people, if you're sitting on a million dollars worth of Bitcoin and you want to buy a half a million dollar house, someone like me, I'll tell you, well, hey, I have like bad credit, for example. That's, I guess what happens when you go to prison for a few years. And I want to buy a house. I can't get a mortgage, but I can get a home equity line of credit if I already own the house. So could you see products where like, you're lending against Bitcoin for a certain amount of time and then moving that collateralization to like another asset because oh. then like I could see a huge amount of products there, but I don't, I don't see people do it. I think the long term is long term lending. Like most businesses and people want to borrow for like long term periods of time, not short term, just like interest only loans because that only services a certain clientele. My brother-in-law, for example, let's just say he owned a Bitcoin. He makes a certain amount of money, but he owns a Bitcoin and he wants to buy a house. Getting a mortgage on a house for, a, for, a, for someone who's like, uh, they're employed on their own, they're self-employed, running their own business, very difficult. You need five years of tax returns. But why? You're taking a mortgage on a house that has that value, even 50% LTV. Like, why not create like co-hybrid collateralization or something like that? I could see, uh, I know that there are other banks listening to this too, and hopefully to doing something like that too. But I hope you guys or other people can do like, like what you're talking about, like creating products that, that hybrid cater to crypto, but also to non-crypto folk and using them to get crypto folk to non-crypto into, into this industry, like loving a Bitcoin and stuff like that. Uh, you're absolutely right. So what do we need to do? I mean, your analogy of, uh, of, the, of the yachting risk, we need to bring yeah. some oil tankers in here. And we used the number earlier on, the traditional banking market has $134 trillion. What do we do if a sophisticated bank is able to offer a client 3 to 4% on their traditional US dollars? And some of that money is then utilized to power DeFi loans and what have you. 
So for example, oh. uh, XFI, we were able to provide fixed term products and floating rate products. Now at the moment, the truth is you couldn't take a loan on, on a BTC loan for a mortgage because the rates are just too high. Mm -hmm. It will calm down though. You can't continue to have you know, 14 to 25% um, uh, loan rate. It's just not sustainable. What do you it will slow down to a point that it is becoming attractive. If you can get six to seven percent or, or or four to seven percent, then it becomes interesting for long-term mortgage opportunity. And it also becomes oh. really interesting for commercial loans and business loans, trade finance, et cetera. And that's where it's going to go. So you're saying that right now, because it's so volatile that the rates are higher, it's not good for those longer term term fixed products. And then a lot of people were saying that, yeah, when the volatility of Bitcoin in the larger crypto market starts to go down, all these yields will go away. And while that may be true, the percentages will go lower. You're saying that actually when the percentages go lower, it opens up the market to a whole different segment. Yeah, well, That's absolutely. brilliant. Freaking and how brilliant. Much, how much of that $134 trillion would move into a bank that's able to offer them 3.5%? So today, as we mentioned, well, why can't they go now and get nine percent? Absolutely. Well, it's the truth is that banks are very, very uncomfortable, uh, and they are so yeah. um, terrified about losing their position as a centralized entity. Plus, obviously, most regulators have no idea what's going in that space. But there's no question that over the next two to three years, very sophisticated banks are going to say, "Hang on, we can take risk off our balance sheet." And we can provide some very, very cool fixed-term products. 90-day product providing 4%, 5%. A year product providing you know, 5%. Wow. Clients are going to love that. And that's the only way you can differentiate yourself from competing entities. So those that get there are going to clean up and directly pump in an enormous amount of money into DeFi. So you'll see it going from 105 billion to 300 to 400 to a trillion within uh, within just a couple of months. Most of us are largely familiar with how, with with why the financial, uh, you know, like really what Bitcoin came out of was the, the great financial crisis in the world of, in 2008. Like most of us living today lived through that and, and had some uh, exposure to it. And like to, to just to dumb it down in, in one sentence, all you know, if you take mortgages and you rate them by their ability to to be percent what what is thought their ability to pay back versus their inability to pay back, and you rate them from like a one to being a shitty mortgage and a ten from being like the guy who's got a hundred percent paid back. If we look at what happened back then, all these like really shitty ones were being bunched up together with some good ones and then packaged together as individual products. If that were to happen today, but it was done on top of a blockchain, or as I heard this morning at the coffee shop, someone said, yeah, I built an NFT and it was, it got chained. I kind of like that. Instead of saying on chain, it got chained. So if these, if, if like all the products and all mortgages were chained, representate, represented on a blockchain in 2007, do you think that could have prevented 2008, 2009 from happening? Absolutely. And why? There's four reasons why it could have been avoided. First, a lot of people were taking massive risk with your money. Bad, bad, bad products. So it was prone to human error and, frankly, fraud. We saw people going to prison as a result of some of the yeah. very speculative things they were doing in 2017, 2016. I shared cells with so, some of those people. <laughs> yeah. You've then got market risk, which few of the global banks were really taking account of. You then got counterparty risk, and then you've got liquidity risk. How can you solve those four problems, Charlie, overnight? Blockchain. Mm. You solve them all. Solve them all. So yes, it can be avoided, and it should have been avoided. I mean, it's too early, obviously, 13 years ago, but there's no reason for it to happen again. We've got fantastic uh, and adequate loan-to-value on most cryptos now in a way that you haven't for traditional lending. You're able to service global markets in a way that today requires so many fractured operating models. I mean, if you try and do an interest rate swap product, you might be working with two to three investment banks across a series of jurisdictions. Super complicated. It's ripe for disruption. Now you can write that code yourself in, in, in a few days. 
Absolutely. And have it audited Absolutely. and ha- and tested and everything. Absolutely. And you know, the only problem with that at the moment is that DeFi itself, in some respects, is a little bit complex, inaccessible. You know, there's no interoperability with traditional banking other than us at the moment. And some of the products have been subject to yeah. the creation by inexperienced teams that might be great coders, but they've got no experience of running financial uh, product sets. And then you've got the issue of over collateralization. In some instances, it's a bit of a wrapper. People are claiming it's DeFi, but really it's kind of it's kind of centralized. And then you still have the issue of of some low liquidity in some instances. But those things are improving. And over the course of the next six to twelve months, you're going to see further maturity in the market and some very cool products. There's a huge there's a huge industry. Uh, um, I've been watching this TV show on Netflix called Good Girls, and there's a huge industry. Um, payday lending and mm. where you wait in line and mm. based on like your paycheck and some other aspects you can borrow $3,000 and the interest rates are like 25% a week and it's like egregious and I actually sit with owners of some of these companies and they explain to me their models and th- these are not bad people they're not bad business models they're honestly businesses that service an industry that would otherwise be left in the dark and Unfortunately, not that they're all good or all bad with with payday lending, these are the rates they have to charge because there's so much fraud and there's so much risk and there's so many people that don't pay because these are uncollateralized. You're seeing in DeFi now so many like uncollateralized or undercollateralized loans. So like the loan to value is lower. How how are they being done now? Like how are how is risk being measured? On chain, how are these loans being done? Who is borrowing this type of money? And then can that aspect be then taken over to the payday loan industry to bring those rates down and really, really do what Satoshi did? He started this for is to bring people out of poverty. It absolutely can, and Charlie, it absolutely should. As an industry, I believe we have a moral duty to fix micro lending. It's you can't sit there and justify charging a hardworking, yeah. uh, part-time mother of three, a uh, part-time worker with a mother of three. You can't charge that, that lady 25% a week and look in the mirror, in my opinion, in my opinion. And I think as a community, we have an amazing opportunity to slightly mature some of our offerings to make it available for those, those lenders, or those, those clients. For example, you know, there are some great organizations that are doing uh, floating rate products today. Compound, Nexo, BlockFi, are doing, uh, BlockFi obviously is, is um, doing some of the stuff. Celsius is doing nice work on fixed term. But there's nothing to prevent us from looking at how we can utilize those, especially floating rate products, um, to, uh, to adapt to a micro lending strategy. Uh, and I think we will. I think we should. And I think we will. It'll take a little bit of time. People are still finding their feet in terms of LTVs in this space and also finding ways to make it more accessible for people that are currently taking payday loans. The average person taking a payday loan today would have no idea how to access these lending facilities. So let's make it simple. Let's make it easier. And I genuinely believe we have a moral obligation to do it. I agree. Jason, Jason Blake, thank you so much for taking the time coming on Untold Stories today. I really, I really appreciate like that, that moral obligation part, because like, I believe that so much that sometimes, uh, I have a hard time like putting that into words, but you're right. Like, I feel like being in this industry, we all have a moral obligation to, to those who haven't seen the light. That sounds like a religion, right? But those who haven't seen the light, like I feel like I have a duty to constantly be be preaching the word of Satoshi. God, it sounds like a religion, but I don't know how else to describe it. But you're right. And thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're busy. You guys have so many clients and, and been servicing us. Thank you for, for doing that. And, and I appreciate you taking the time and coming on the show today. Thank you, Charlie. It's always an absolute pleasure. <laughs>